Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald, my chance to talk with creative gamers and game creators. And joining me today once again is Jerry Hawthorne of Plat Hat Games. Welcome back to the show, Jerry. Hey, how's it going? It's going good, man, because I'm here with you <laughs> once again. This awesome. is this is like our annual Jerry update at this point. Awesome. Yes, it is. Hey. Like old friends. Yeah, yeah. And we got stuff to talk about. Jerry, you are you got another mouse game coming out. What's up with this? I do, I do. Um, I have Aftermath coming out, and uh, I'm super excited about it. So uh, if I gush a little bit about the game, uh, that's why. Well, we are on the uh, internet, so it's kind of the place to gush about things. And <laughs> I do love mice and mice and board games, so I'm going to gush about things a little bit. But you know, this is kind of the perfect platform. So tell me about this game. It's, it's the new adventure book game by Plaid Hat, right? Yes. Yes. So I got this line of games that I'm doing called adventure book games, where basically the thing that connects them is they're all games that are played within this big adventure book. And you actually play the game inside the book. And they're all cooperative games, because that's really the kind of game style that I, that I like best. And um, But... Each of them is a completely different theme, and um, although they do borrow some mechanics from the previous um, iterations, they always like do something radically different. Right, and this is the the third game we had: Stuff Fables and Comanots, and now this is coming right around the corner. Do we have a release date for it yet? It's going to be late September, from what I'm told, uh, barring any sort of snafus. So, oh, and those never happen. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's really kind of hard to predict, you know, because, you know, customs and, and all the other crazy stuff happening in the world. But um, but yeah, it should be like, you know, it, it should be coming out late September, early October, somewhere around in there. So um, and then it, it's also going to be released um, with a sister game called Battlelands, which is just a little card game um, that takes place in the same world. And has a lot of the same locations and stuff, but it's a completely different game. It's a little three to five player card game that you can just slap on the table and, and quickly get a game going and play a little battle. But it's such a cool little game. Um, I wanted to, I wanted, uh, it, it was uh, designed by Andrea Mezzatero, and I wanted to publish this game so bad. Um, but the problem is that, you know, little little card games like that that need a lot of art, that they're they're hard to be they're hard to make on a standalone product so having a tie-in product like this has really allowed me to bring this cool little game to the public so i i don't want that one to be lost in the shuffle either because it's super cool right and that came first or as far as the announcement we ended up seeing yeah. uh and reporting on battlelands aftermath edition first so yeah the, the aftermath edition implies to me that there's going to be more legs to battlelands than you might initially think here yeah, I mean, we hope that uh, people love it as much as we do. We play it all the time around the office. It's it's, it's super popular game around our gaming circles and stuff because it's really fun and it's really easy to get on the table and it's just super streamlined and it's just fun, quick playing little game. Um, but it feels real satisfying when you play it. You feel like you had this big epic game in this little small package. Um, and what we want to do is we want to give the give a similar experience using the same engine but with different themes on it and stuff. And so um, uh, we're hoping that people love it as much as we do, because then we can do like, you know, a, a Dead of Winter version or, you know, a Mice and Mystics version even, you know. Okay, so. let, let, let's talk about this because you brought it up. So Mice and Mystics, <laughs> you know, this was really the breakout game for Jerry Hawthorne. And for for mm -hmm. anyone who's just listening to this as their first episode of the Cardboard Herald, Go back and listen to my first interview with Jerry, and then we did one with you and Colby, and we kind of got into the history of like where you came from, the origin story, and then your yeah. your evolution from hairstylist to full time game designer, and then now we're picking up kind of from the the Comanots pre release era to to here. And I was really surprised when Battlelands was announced and subsequently Aftermath because I was like, wait a second, like this is this is saying that it's in the Aftermath universe, but it's not in the Mice and Mystics universe. And this is a mouse game. Like what's going on? Is Plaid Hat having parallel paw and claw fantasy games <laughs> going on? Like are, are we canning Mice and Mystics for now and just focusing on Aftermath? Like what is the connection here? Because obviously people are going to be thinking of these in, in parallels. 
it's complicated, but like, you know, I, I did Mice and Mystics and then, and then it's expansions and stuff and everything was roaring along. But then when, um, we, when I got signed, when I signed Mice and Mystics for a movie deal, um, we sort of had to put a halt on producing any more Mice and Mystics games oh. because we didn't know when or if the movie was going to get made and we didn't want the, we didn't want to go off track and go in a different direction. Maybe the movie would go and we were hoping to maybe get some sort of tie in with it and all this stuff. And that's basically still where we're at, but I don't, I mean, I don't want to stop designing in that, in that space, that, that thematic space. And for years I've been talking about doing a, a, a mouse game that took place in a different time period rather than having it be medieval fantasy. Um, I, this one takes place in the modern world. And what's really, really super cool about it is it, it's heart and soul are the same. It's, it's about these little creatures and about their, their huge, enormous task ahead of them and stuff and about how they have to work together. And it has all the same characteristics and virtues of any other classic medieval fantasy mouse story. But it takes place in like a, a setting that you probably wouldn't expect. It just kind of comes out of left field. And it's really, 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 really cool. Yeah, one of the things that I love most is in like post-apocalyptic settings. Like I, I honestly think the the setting has been overdone to some degree when you think about like wastelands i mean of course i love mad max fury road that that was like mm -hmm. a revelatory movie but I, i'm done looking at wasteland desert scapes what i'm not done with is nature reclaiming human environments yeah. and you know i'm i'm in Juneau, alaska where the wildlife will overtake a building if it's abandoned for like a year let alone exact 30 or 100 and that's what's so evocative about this game is i'm looking at all these artifacts these remnants of humanity but it's not that humanity has destroyed the planet it's that the planet has recovered itself from humanity yes. and that that is so compelling that, that's such a cool setting yeah i mean i could have drawn out the, the the concept longer and came up with this long story as to what happened to humanity but it's so much more like it's so much more ev evocative this way one day they're there and one minute they're there and the next minute humans disappear they're gone mm -hmm. they are immediately gone planes tumble out of the sky trains crash buildings burn but it's not at the result of any war. It's at the result of this immediate loss of humanity. And right then and there, at that very moment, nature just starts to reclaim. Mm -hmm. And so we, the whole thing takes place in this vibrant world teeming with life, but also teeming with the, the footprint left by humanity. Um, the excessive consumerism is a big feature in this game. And we really highlight all, the, all, all, the, all these things about humans – and we do it in clever ways. We do it through product ad placement throughout the game, but they're all fake products, and they're made to sort of poke fun at, at, at humanity. How much of Rax On are we going to get in this? No, there's, there's, <laughs> there's on. only one tiny little Rax On uh, thing. Okay, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And that yeah. wasn't even you're, my idea. They, they, they just put the logo on one little card. But um, You're this has nothing to do to with, the, with the racks on stuff. There's no way that that Colby and Isaac would have the restraint not to put a little bit of racks on somewhere. It's not the... them. It's not them. It was <laughs> Dave. Dave, the graphic designer, put that stuff on there. But um, yeah, so what we do is like uh, we come up with uh, we have our artists render um, product, you know, bags and cans and and, and packaging but without any label on it. And then we have the graphic designers come in and put a label on there. And we come up with products that mimic real world products, you know, um, and, and just fill the game full of all these, all this, all this stuff, you know, and um, just, you know, really, really, really trying to make people think about environmental custodianship and, you know, the, uh, like by, by, by putting yourself in these little creatures and just completely, removing humankind from the equation it allows you this weird way of like thinking about um how what weird creatures we are you know let's talk about the scope of the game like what kind of campaign are we dealing with here i mean how does this differ in i guess uh, uh pace and progression than previous storybook games or uh, adventure book games uh, excuse me I, I have a toddler, so I, I'm stuck in storybook <laughs> okay. mode. So this game is kind of it's kind of weird. Um, the game is campaign only. This the only way you play the game is through campaign only. But 
you know how when you play a campaign, you have a lot of record keeping and overhead and you, you know, it can be daunting. It can be kind of overwhelming and it sometimes makes people go, Ugh, you know, about a campaign. Do I have to manage all this stuff? But the game manages it all for you. It's super streamlined where, where the campaign's concerned. Um, what you do is you start the game and you have this big box. We, you have deck boxes that you construct for, for everything right at the beginning. You just unfold them, put them together, stick your cards in these deck boxes. Well, one of the deck, deck boxes is a discovery deck. And so that one's the, the, the thickest deck of them all when you start your campaign. Well, as you're discovering things, the game will send you into that discovery box and you'll pull out cards that you'll add to your world. So you're going to be changing your world by adding cards that you bring out of this deck box. So when you start off the game, there's just a couple of missions and you, your very first mission always has to be the, the, the mission that the game tells you to take. And you take that first mission. But while you're on that mission, that mission will generate like two or three more missions. And then these, you keep on getting more and more things that you generate, more missions, more story, more things that you unlock. And they all get pulled out of the discovery box and then they get put into their appropriate boxes. And then you, whenever the game tells you to get them out, you just get them out. So these are like branching paths that you can optionally explore and choose to go on. So it's not going to be a singular That's linear right. adventure. Okay. It's, well, it's more sandboxy. Okay. Will you have the choice to view all of that content in one campaign, or do you sometimes make choices to go in a direction at the expense of another? Yes. You'll, you'll make decisions that often seal off one branch of the, of the, the, the storyline. But instead of having like a super linear story, it's more like a spider web. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. And, and um, there's, I think there's, I can't remember exactly how many missions there are, but there's over 20 missions in the game, right? You're not going to play all 20 of them. Usually people play about, I say, I think on average to, to finish the campaign is about 13 to 15 missions to finish the campaign. If this is someone's jam, if this is like a game that people absolutely love, is there the possibility in these adventure book games to expand upon the content? Because so far, Stuff Fables, Comanauts, they've been standalone okay. things. Aftermath is now yet a new thing that's separate and apart from these others. But if people fall in love with these universes and they, they love the campaign, they love the choices that they made, does Plaid Hat even entertain the idea that there could be a Aftermath Part 2? Well, Aftermath is designed a little differently than the other adventure book games. Um, we made this sort of a plug-and-play game, so we we intend to add more content to it. It's designed with that intent. Um, we have um, four small expansions that are already in the works, um, and we have a big expansion that's already in the works. Uh, or in plan is planned. We, so we have four small ones that are already in the works and one that's planned. Um, obviously, these all depend upon the success of the game. I can't just come out saying, <laughs> hey, you know this, you know what I'm saying? Because, I, mean, right. I mean, I work for a company and they need to make money. Um, <laughs> so you say that, it's Asmodee that well, owns everything. You know what? They, they can let this be your little private project, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just, they'll just do that because they like me. But I also am working on a Stuff Fable expan expansion as well. You know, adventure book games were brand new with Stuff Fables, and it, they're still fairly young. So we're seeing where 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 we want to go with these, and um, uh, I think we're we're getting to we're really kind of catching our stride with these now. Yeah, and. Right now, it seems like Plaid Hat is in a, a time of transition. I mean, there was the initial phase of it growing as a company. This is back when Colby had established Plaid Hat as, you know, a, a viable games company pre-Kickstarter with Summoner Wars. And then you started getting games like uh, Bioshock was coming out and then Mice and Mystics and, of course, Dead of Winter. And that was kind of when Plaid Hat was a hot young company. And then eventually you get into the Asmodee purchase. And now it sounds like there's some restructuring going on with Plaid Hat. And just based off of paying attention to the news, it seems like you guys are hungry to to find what is the next kind of groove for you to get into. And you're, you're doing like a spaghetti at the wall type of thing. What is the next chapter for Plaid Hat Games? Well, we're... You know, we're creative individuals, so I never stop creating. I'm in a constant state of creating. Like, it's not, I wouldn't necessarily call it throwing spaghetti at the walls, but that's probably the most 
easiest way to say it. When you do something creative and you put it out there, and if it's received well, you 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 want to repeat that, or you want to you want to support that. And if it's not received well, you you take that and you you make notes and you and you move along. We don't want to let anything you know uh, anything sway us from the from our creativity, though. That's where it's really important. So if I have something uh, something that I want to say creatively and it comes in the form of an expansion for one of my existing works and I bring it to my boss and he thinks it sounds like a great idea. If I bring it up to Colby and he thinks it's a great idea, then we have an expansion. If I bring it up to him and he's like, yeah, we can't do that right now. Our numbers aren't this or whatever. Then we don't have an expansion. But you're right. Right now we are in this wonderful state of transition, but it's like it's not like a restructuring. It's more of like a rejuvenation. Um, we just moved into a big, beautiful offices, you know, brand new offices and everything. Our team is just we are just functioning like on all on all levels. Just everything's hitting really nicely right now. So our cre- creativity and our teamwork is is top notch right now. So I see nothing but awesomeness for us in the future. And you've even hired Nikki from Board With Life to Absolutely. be part of your team. She's like the the PR manager over there. Yeah, we have our we have our own marketing person now. We have Nikki, and uh, we have a bunch of great games coming out. I, I know you've probably seen uh, Quirky Circuits is uh, is an exciting new game that we have coming out. Super fun. And then we have Abomination coming out, and um, that one's just so crazy awesome. Um, Isaac's working on a secret game that we can't talk about. And that one's going to be coming out next year, and it's phenomenal. And I feel like Isaac is always working on a secret game that you can't talk about. Like he's in a perpetual state of secret game. <laughs> well, if we, if we talk about stuff too early, then um, we sort of uh, we don't have the the ability to adapt and change or whatever, you know? Right, right, right. right. Uh, we're sort of people will hold us to it, and we get stuck in that. Well, back but, to aftermath. So, yep. This game, we've talked about it thematically, but mechanically, not just in the progression, but, you know, in the nuts and bolts of how you play the game, how does this differ from the previous adventure book games? In my previous adventure book games, um, the main the main mechanic was reaching into a bag, pulling out some dice, and then allocating those dice to what you wanted to do on your turn. Um, the, this game completely takes away that those dice, right? In this game, you have a deck of action cards, and your action cards are basically very simple. They are numbers and colors. You'll be playing with a hand of action cards, and you can combine um, you can combine color, colors together, and you can also combine numbers together. So you can really, if you're going to do a task, these are your action cards, this is the, the cards you have to work with. And of course, you can share cards with your fellow players and stuff to you know give you that create or that cooperation going, but. If you go to, uh, to, to do a task, um, a skill check or, or an attack or something like that, you're going to need to use the appropriate color card. Um, so you play that to initiate that task. And then in addition to that card, you can play any other card you have that matches the color and number of that first card. And then finally, you'll roll this little res- resolution dice that is a little bump die. It just adds a tiny bit of randomness to it. So you still have that tension, but you can overcome that tension if you can play your cards right and get a good hand of cards and overcome the, the little luck factor and get a, a guaranteed success. So that's pretty much how, how the engine works. And how much of this change was driven by innovation, just wanting to do something brand new for this brand new adventure book game? And how much of this was like iteration, trying to improve upon the feedback that you were getting from Stuff Fables and Cominots and try to come up with something that, you know, was going to latch on with the dedicated hobby gamer a little bit more? Innovation, I guess, uh, because of the things that I like and things I'm into. And I'm also in the mainstream of gamers, you know, and I see what I like and I see how different games are doing stuff. Um, like I, I like games like Wildlands and you have these cards and the cards are interesting because of the lack of information on them. So you're, you're really focused on what you can do. Well, I love that. And so this is my kind of, my kind of version of that kind of approach towards a game where you, you're doing things with the simple set of cards that you can teach real quickly. You never, you never forget how to play. And then all that stuff just sort of goes, uh, you know, kind of melts away as you enjoy the story. 
So you as a designer have so much more experience than 10 years ago. How, what, what year did My Mystics come out? I mean, it, it feels like it must 2012. have been. 2012. Okay, so we're talking seven years ago now. That's getting close to a decade. So you have a ton more experience. And undoubtedly, you have heard endless amount of praise, but also criticism for Mice and Mystics. How much of this game, if any at all, was you hungry to take a, a new crack at evoking these thematic elements with a, a much more nuanced mechanical mind? Do you kind of get what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I'll, it might not it might not manifest itself in me the same way that you might be thinking. My whole my whole desire to to not uh, my whole desire to break out of the mice and mystics mold is so that I can create a a game where the rule book doesn't scare away my intended audience. Right, so right. My intended audience is not like some hardcore deep strategizing, you know, min maxing kind of gamer. My my target audience are families or mixed mixed skill level gamers where you don't want to scare anybody away or I'm 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 just introducing Joe Blow here to the world of hobby games and let's try this game, you know, because it's easy to teach, easy to learn. It 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 delivers a satisfying and and uh adventurous uh experience without all the rule overhead and stuff like that. So my main intent is just to try to lower the footprint that the, that those rules are and make the rules not a barrier to entry. I think I've even told you this on the show before, but we look at the rule book as a barrier that the players have to overcome before they can actually play the game. And that to me is, I mean, that's at the heart of everything I do with my designs is just to try to alleviate that for people. Yeah, and that I, I think we're actually thinking along the same lines because I, I don't think that you need to make Mice and Mystics more complex. And, and I don't think that becoming a, a more experienced game designer would empower you some way to make it more complex. I think it actually takes a greater amount of skill in order to make a very elegant system that is able to convey the the complex thematic elements and, and the tones and the style of play that you really want to hit without all that overhead. And I guess that's really at the heart of the, the question is if you were redesigning Mice and Mystics today, not to say that Aftermath is what that game would be, but do you ever get the feeling like, man, if I were to take another crack at that, there, there's so many things that I would revamp in order to make sure that that game is the best thing that it could possibly be. Yeah, of course. I mean, um, and that's my intent. My intent is, you know, when um, we return to Mice and Mystics that, you know, I'm coming after it with not just the love of the original and not just wanting to practice that love and make sure that it, that, that integrity is maintained, but also to update it in such a way that it meshes more with its target audience rather than having a big fat rule book that, you know, I have these families that are sitting around the table waiting to play and they're thumbing through a rule book. And that's, that's just not, that's just not going to work at all for me as a designer to have that experience, to deliver that experience that grates against my mission is, is are, are, is just not going to work for me. Would you ever consider doing an app integrated game? I mean, I, I know that, like, for example, Journeys in Middle-Earth was a, a pretty substantial game. Oh, we got some sirens. We got a real taste of <laughs> Dallas down there right now. City life. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, pretty soon there will be a drive-by, and then you'll actually get the exciting the exciting <laughs> bits that we deal with. So, um, The app integration is, is cool and all, and I love it. But it's, not, it's totally not something I'm interested in. The, and the reason is because I... There's something organic about just a board game. There's just that there's just that organic quality to it that that I like so much. I want all my games to have almost feel like a relic. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I totally know what you're talking about. There's a physicality to things. I mean, I'm a guy who's sitting across from a record collection with hundreds of records right now because not that I think that physical media sounds inherently better, but because I love the the ritual and the intimacy that I have with those records. When I pick up an album, 
I'm looking at a piece of art, a depiction of something, something that establishes tone. I set the needle on and then I'm actually listening to with intent an album as was intended to be listened to it's not on shuffle and then when i flip the album i i have to pay attention to what's going on which encourages me to engage with music a lot more than i do when it's just on my phone and i'm yeah. skipping past songs like i've listened to it listened to it listened to it and yeah. i can't really settle on anything so i go to a podcast and uh -huh. that's not to say that people can't have that intimate experience with digital media people do but for some people you and me that that physicality that that intimacy that comes with an artifact is important oh when i made my submit six years ago i set out to make a game what i called i wanted to call an heirloom game where you know it's one of those games where you don't sell it you save it because you want to give it to your grandchildren or whatever you know something that you hang on to so it has that rich quality throughout all of its components and i I look back on that and I imagine like, what if I had made Mice and Mystics with an app? Would that app still be relevant now? Would that app be, would it, you know, would it have gotten support? We've, you know, we've, we're at the, the third, you know, company or the second company that's bought us out, you know, where do these, where do these apps go and all that stuff? I, I really have always preached that board games are the cure for a disconnected society, for a society who we've gotten so much into our devices and stuff like that. And I love them. I have my, we're on, you know, I'm on a device right now. I'm on my iPad right now. We, I mean, I love devices, but something has to bring us together, you know, for a holistic experience. And I think board games are the answer to that. And because of that, we sort of have the sacred duty, I think, as board game designers to always pay tribute to that. I'm going to include myself in the we in that, even though I'm nowhere <laughs> near a board game designer. I, I'll, I'll be an advocate, a, a fervent supporter. Well, I say, you know, I say board game designers like we're some sort of, you know, exalted class within this hobby. But really, we're only just uh, the designers are only one equally sized piece in the puzzle that creates this hobby. And a hobby is all about this, uh, you know, bringing people together. So uh, you can't have a situation where you want to bring people together, but you also have people who want to be running the show like some, you know, superstar. I think you'll you'll notice that. Game designers, for the most part, are some of the most humble um, people that you'll ever meet. I think I, I, mean, I know I've met so many of them in this industry, and I think it's part of it's just part of the culture of our industry. It's it is a wonderful and completely unique industry when it comes to the creators, the the publishers. I mean, it, we got our bad eggs, but for the most part, it is such a breath of fresh air when you go to a convention and just everyone is willing to talk to you as a gamer, like not not even as a media person. Like people are just grateful that you are interested in cool games because the truth is everyone that's doing this, the, who's involved in the manufacturing, the production, the development of these things in the content creation, they're just excited in cool games, too. Like that that's mm -hmm. really what it comes down to. But we got a couple other things that I want to talk about here. You mentioned a couple times now the Mice and Mystics movie, which I, I want to know what was the moment in which you were told, yo, th this is being optioned for like a movie deal. A and what was your reaction? Like, did you actually think that was true or did you think it was a joke? Were you like full of anxiety? For me, I'd be like, oh, no, people are going to be scrutinizing this <laughs> like crazy. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can imagine the the, the swirling morass of emotions that I had because of it. Um, I was actually contacted um, on my cell phone by a lady who was um, the personal assistant of the director that wanted to make my movie. She was asking me if we, she could set up a call with me. And she and, and I was I still didn't quite believe her. I thought I was being punked. You know, I was looking for Ashton <laughs> Kutcher. I was like, where is that Ashton? Um, but the she she gave me some information about him, told me to go look him up. So I went to IMDb and I looked him up and he was legit. And um, I had my concerns, though, because he um, he's a director that does uh, had only really done a, a string of horror movies, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I also I also love when people are able to tell a story and have have it be a wholesome story, but also have the tension and the darkness because you know, the world is a dark place that we live in. So I think it's to be intellectually honest when you tell a story, it's it's perfectly OK to be a little bit dark. 
Mm-hmm. Of um, course. So I was really intrigued by that. Um, and I freaked out. I called Colby and um, I was like, call the cold, this is what's <laughs> happening. And he was like, wow, that's really great. I'm like, so what are we gonna do? He's like, I don't know what you're gonna do. I'm like, well, well but, but, and he's like, I don't wanna have anything to do with this. This is, this is all you. I don't know anything about making movies. I, he didn't want it on his plate. Um, and he was running his little company, you know? And so I was like, oh my God, I'm on my own. He's like, it's your intellectual property. You deal with it, you know? I'm like, oh crap. So um, I went to one of my clients at the time who I knew her husband was a lawyer. And he worked for uh, one of the hotshot law firms in downtown Dallas and their law firm. He knew of this lady who was Dallas's top entertainment lawyer and um, got me in contact with her. And I got in contact with her and she's like, you're in you're in you're in luck, Jerry. You know, Dallas has this great um, program where local talent. We try to promote local talent uh, and keep that talent in Dallas. And um, so uh, our our legal office is prepared to do a significant portion of this work pro bono. And so I was able to get a good entertainment lawyer and was able to negotiate these, these uh, movie contracts. It's been a multi-year process. It's been about four years of working on this. We've had some highs and some lows. Um, right now we're in a low, <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that there's more of a likelihood that the movie won't get made, but at the same time, movies very rarely make it as far as mine has gotten in the process. So we shall see. Hey, yeah, man. I mean, that that happens all the time where things get announced and people take it as like, this means this movie is actually getting created. Like the, the there are movies that are, you know, just option deals, there's scripts, there's things like it green lighted and then canned all the time. But that's awesome that you're even at this stage. And I, I'm blown away that the the rights were put into your court. Was that something that was formally worked out by you and Colby back in the day when Mice and Mystics was coming around? Was that an informal agreement that, yeah, Mice and Mystics is really Jerry's thing? As far as I'm concerned, with the oversight of Asthma Day uh, looming over you, that uh, they haven't gotten involved saying, you know what, we need to be part of this project. Well, I mean, it, they could be. Uh, like, if if if... I get the movie rights if I get the rights back again, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and the movie falls through or whatever. Um, Asmodee's perfectly uh, it's it's perfectly perfectly within their power to acquire the rights from me. Yeah, just like yeah, any totally. other entity. Um, so, uh, and and that I mean I, I mean that who knows that it could be an option later on. I have no idea. I guess what what I'm asking is was there even like a contract back in the day where you and Colby sat down and said, all right, the, the game itself is going to be mine, but the world setting and narrative that the game takes place in and depicts is going to be yours. Yeah. Basically there, there was, I mean, we've, um, Colby's always been, um, very business savvy, even when he was really young. And so he, he made sure that all of our T's were crossed and our eyes were dots and we had contracts on things. But the spirit in which we entered into our uh, partnership, me and me and Colby, was that Colby was a brand new game company. He started, he wanted to publish a game, Summoner Wars, and he couldn't get it published, so he decided to start his own publishing company to get that game published. When the game became popular, and then he realized he didn't have any other games. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yep, yep, yep. He had he had poured all of his efforts into that one game, and then all of his efforts into getting it published, and you know, all of his efforts into starting up this company so he could publish his, his game. And then he's got this company, he's got this game, no other games. And you can't just make a game like that, you know? Um, so he, he asked probably not just me, but he probably asked a few friends, um, who he had worked with if they were dabbling with anything. Cause I had always said, you know, uh, you know, I was always tinkering game designs and stuff. And so he came to me and he asked me, he's like, do you got anything? And I said, no, you know, and this is back and, when uh, you guys were all part of the HeroScape community, or like, yeah. what was the remnants of the HeroScape? Yeah, and I was still, I was whatever. still freelancing for Hasbro. Okay, um, and um, so he came to me. He's like, "Do you have any games?" I'm like, "No," and he's like, "You don't have anything?" I'm like, "Well, nothing, nothing that would be that you'd be interested in," and and that that was about the time that um, you know that. I started working on Mice and Mystics for my daughter, and I 
my buddy Chad Hoverter, who's our sculptor for our um, company, he, he he sculpted the miniatures for Mice and Mystics. I came to him and I was like, you know, he, or I'm sorry, he came to me and he was like, you know, my my sculpting mentor wants me to go around and ask friends and family members to give me some ideas of something to sculpt, and then I'm supposed to sculpt it and work on my craft because you know, since it comes from somebody else, then I'll, I'll get experience sculpting for other people and trying to meet their, their, uh, their vision. Do you have any ideas for something you want me to sculpt? And I said, at the time I'd been thinking about this little mouse idea. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I said, yeah, could you, can you sculpt me a little warrior mouse with like a big old battle ax, you know, and like all ready to fight. And he's like, Oh, that sounds like fun. And so I didn't know, I didn't expe even expect him to actually follow through on it. But about a week later, he showed up at my house. He's like, check it out. He's got this cool little mouse with a battle axe, and it's just bad to the bone. And I was like, oh, my God. So I took a picture of it, and we had this. This is back before social media was really a, you know, a big thing. We had this little private internet website forum thing that, um, that Colby had made for all of us creatives that were all kind of doing stuff, you know, and, but we're all friends. And so I posted the picture on there. Well, that night, about 10 o'clock at night, Colby calls me. He's like, I thought you weren't working on anything. <laughs> Yo, what's up, homie? This, He's this like, mouse what the is hell dope. is this picture? Yeah, this mouse is cool as shit. What, what the hell are you doing? What, what have you been working on? And he was mad. And I was like, well, uh, yeah, I guess I've kind of been working on something. He's like, well, give me the pitch. I'm like, well, you know, he's like, just give me the pitch. Just give me the pitch. And I go, okay. It's like a fully cooperative dungeon crawl, RPG adventure kind of thing, but made for families, and you play the part of a little warrior mouse, a human being that's been transformed into a little mouse, and the kingdom's in peril, and you still have to save the kingdom, but now you're just, you know, you're two inches tall. And he's like, I want to publish that game. And I go, but hold on now. I go, I want to put a lot of story in this game, more story than anybody's ever done in a board game before. There's going to be a lot of reading it's going to break up the gameplay because that's what it's all designed to do. And he's like, oh, man, that sounds even better. And so <laughs> he's like, do you think you could have a prototype for me by Gen Con, which was six months away? So I, you know, was working way more than full time hours. But in the evenings, late at night, I was, you know, making my little prototype, testing things out. I was going over to my buddy's house on the weekends. We were play testing stuff, you know, and I was writing a story. That's how I made it. The rest is history. And yeah. you mentioned your daughter, and I know you've talked about this candidly a couple times where you talked about Mice and Mystics and the development of that for, I believe at the time it was like helping your daughter learn how to read and, you know, to engage in a story. And you and I have actually talked about stuff fables and the, the intimacy of that that story and the the personal connection that you have with it and the the protective guardian that a stuffed animal is to your own child and that was incredibly meaningful to me to hear from a, a more experienced father because i i have one son who i mentioned earlier he's he's a toddler or i keep calling him a toddler he's four years <laughs> old now he's, he's quickly approaching kid age you know how is uh, how is fatherhood going right now, and how is that impacting you as a creative person? Well, well, first of all, every everything I do, like everything I do, comes from stories uh, with, inside me uh, that are based upon my real life experiences and you know my quirky way of looking at the world and things that I want to express. I do that through my game design, and if I wasn't allowed to do that through my game design, I just wouldn't do game design um, because it's a form of expression for me. So I do this with every game. Um, the, my kids are teenagers now. My daughter is 17 years old. Um, she's driving and working. And, Frightening. Um, she, it's crazy. And she's incredibly awesome. Gets wonderful grades. Couldn't ask for a better daughter. She's, she's absolutely perfect. Um, my son is 15 now, and he's sort of a surly, quiet teenager <laughs> and he's very, he, he's very, uh, intellectual and, um, he's kind of a reckless. He sort of keeps to himself quiet and shy and reserved. And, but he likes, you know, he likes, uh, the nerdly things that, that we like. And he, um, he's mostly interested in video games. Um, and I don't blame him cause they're awesome. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's just, uh, 
he he's kind of, like I said, he's kind of quiet and kind of hard to he's kind of hard to decipher. But he uh, over spring break, he came to my office with me every day and we grinded through, uh, you know, one session of playing through the entire campaign of Aftermath with my son. And that's it's just, you know, it's it's one of those times, you know, this is, we made memories him coming to work with me every day for a week, seeing what I do and then actually doing it with me is just an incredible experience. And I'm so fortunate that I get to do something like that. You know, every day I thank, you know, the stars above that I'm able to actually do this for a living. And, uh, and then being able to share that with my son is quite something. And it's neat how, you know, his way of playing the game and his way of connecting with it really sort of informed some of my, you know, some of my, uh, ways that I massage the way that the game plays and stuff. Um, but the game is, it's got kind of a, a cool edge to it, you know? So if you think of like these, um, popular movies that are all about, you know, young teenagers and stuff and, uh, dealing with this, you know, things, you know, with these big science fiction storylines and stuff like that, it kind of fits right in there. But these teenagers are mice and hamsters and guinea pigs. And so you're getting like the, you're getting like that uh, divergent series, but you're getting it all through the eyes of little critters and stuff. And that's, I just think that's just cool as anything. Um, and so my son's 15 thought the game was cool as hell. Um, but I think that anybody, anybody who loved, uh, loved mice and mystics, it's like right in that zone, you know? And Hey, that's a total win for you because anytime that a dad can manage to make their 15 year old son think anything they did was cool, is like an automatic win there. <laughs> That's yeah. That that, you, that yeah. is a high bar to reach. Now you mentioned the the different animals that are in there. I, I was wondering because I, I saw like there's a guinea pig with a, an axe or something. And and were there any animals in here where you were so incredibly stoked at finally including this animal? Like you, you just grinned to yourself. You were giggling. You were like, I, I had to have this thing in there. Well, they, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of moments about designing this game that just had me smiling so hard because what I've done is like I, I was able to structure the way that the that the adventure book works through uh, my experiences with Comanauts and how I changed the way that the spaces, the movement spaces and stuff are on the board so I can have big creatures, right? And so instead of having a paw represent the cat in the game, you could just get this big plastic cat, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I got these big creatures in there and, and it's just fantastic to so being able to play with a full scale miniature of a cat, you know, um, as, as one of the big bad guys in this is fantastic. But, but guinea pig, we had guinea pigs as pets in our house and we've had mice as pets. And so being able, we've had hamsters. So being able to get all of our pets in there, all the pets that we have loved and cared for throughout the years, being able to get them represented in the game, um, is just cool as hell. Um, Grumple, the, the guinea pig is one of my favorite characters because I love her storyline so much um she's basically what's what's neat about uh, uh, about grumble's character is that she is the she's the big warrior muscle of the group right mm -hmm. um and she's got a bad attitude because of her you know uh, have you ever raised guinea pigs or anything oh yes i i so was guinea like, pigs... <laughs> i i was all about the rodents when i was young rodents and lizards you couldn't get them away from me <laughs> yeah i love lizards too we've had them we've had lizards um, the guinea pigs love fresh vegetables. They just love fresh vegetables. And so if you're going to be a guinea pig owner, you're going to be buying a lot of fresh vegetables and peppers are their favorite. Um, so I had this little, this little personality storyline with, uh, with Grumple in the game where she's, she's always sort of a little bit on the grumpy side because she doesn't have her access to fresh vegetables that she, that she would like, you know? And so, you know, um, every character in the game, in order to complete the campaign, all you got to do is complete all of the characters' personal missions. And Grumple's personal mission is to build a garden in the backyard of the house on Abigail Lane where they've set up their colony. And so in order to build a garden, you have to have water. In order to you plant plants, you have to have seeds. And you have to put all these pieces into play in order to complete her portion of the game. And it's just part of how the just part of how the game works 
you know, you design games with so many story elements, so many thematic elements. Like, I want to know, like, because this is kind of like your your subject matter expertise here, as you've learned through designing all these games, how do you judge when you are putting too much emphasis on mechanics that are necessary to reflect particular story elements versus like making a, a seamless mechanical game that is is convenient and fun to play where the story elements aren't aren't like interfering with that smooth transition yeah hey, i'm still working on it man i'm a work in progress <laughs> the, um that's that's the real key isn't it it's to deliver a story where it feels like you're playing in a Pixar movie or something, you know, without having the special effects guys stumble through the scene. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. And so, <laughs> so it's, it, that ruins the immersion. And, um, and sometimes, I mean, it's really, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's, I think it's tough. Um, and I like the challenge and I feel like I'm up for it. Um, and it always keeps me moving forward and stuff. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't ever get tired of that challenge, but I can't say that I've actually perfected it. I was just writing a scene for my um, for my Stuff Fables expansion the other day, and I was thinking about this very thought where and I thought to myself, you know, I'm trying to tell this one simple scene, and if I was making a video game, it'd be super easy to do, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. But I want to I want to have these I want to have these characters have to. Uh, I don't want to give away too much, but the, I want these. I want these characters to have to float on birthday cakes down a river made of discarded soda. soda oh, pop, okay. Right? Uh, appetizing. And yeah. And the, and, but you would, you wouldn't believe how much space on my page is being taken up by stupid little, you know, rules that need to be there to cover. What if that, what if this, what if that, what if this, you know, and it's just, it, it gets to be so obnoxious sometimes that it's pulling away from the story and then I have to scrap it and think, okay, how can I approach this scene, still convey the same kind of drama and the same kind of fun that I want to uh, convey, but do it in a seamless way like they would in a video game where you don't have to teach anybody anything. It's just there, and you do. It's tough. It, it's and, tough. And I think that's probably the, the biggest criticism that I would have as someone who believes and loves Mice and Mystics, you know, like that, that's a game where I, I wanted to enjoy and did enjoy with my wife. We played through the entire campaign series of that game, but the idea of going back to it, it it's the the intrusive moments in which the, the story dictates that some new mechanical element that comes into play just for this one moment is meant to enhance the story but what it effectively does is bogs you down with okay how does this work and, with and procedural it can, stuff yeah yeah it removes you from that story so achieving that balance yeah. has got to be incredibly tough what we did with stuff fables is, and and comanauts and then now again with aftermath is we have environment cards where you know we don't even put those rules in the book if they're rarely used so we just put them on a card and just say grab this card lay it next to the book if you need it, you can pass it around the table if you if you want to look at it. That's a little bit easier than looking stuff up in a rule book. What I hated about Mice and Mystics is that everything was front loaded in the rule book, but like, you know, you might not ex you might play the game a couple of times and not experience water, and suddenly here you have water, but you don't know how to do it, and then you have to look it up in the rule book, but nowhere is it telling you what page to go to or whatever, you know. So you have to go find it in the rule book. We treated the we treated the audience as if they just learned the rules and now they know how to play the game. And you can't do that. I don't even want to do that. Um, if water is going to happen a couple of times in the course of a campaign, then we just need to explain it then and there. And the cards are great because at least they keep it consistent. Oh, I've seen this card before. Oh, yeah, you know. And so I don't know. We've talked about Aftermath. We've talked about mm -hmm. Mice and Mystics here. We even talked a bit about Stuffed Fables. Last time that you were on the podcast, we talked a lot about Comanauts. Comanauts was something that seemed like it was a very ambitious story, but the reception was more mixed than the acclaim that Stuffed Fables ended up receiving. 
And for people who maybe have dismissed the adventure book game, um, what do you think about Aftermath is a response to that? Mm. I have no idea whether, um, you know, what, what the reception of Comanauts is truly. Um, I don't have any like sales figures or anything uh, mm -hmm. to work with on that, but the, um, but I'm super proud of Comanauts and I think that it is, I, I, I still believe in that. I think it's like, uh, it's, it, it is an incredible journey for me. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, one of the problems, um, that we have in this market with a game like Comanauts is just not being able to, uh, really determine who it's for, you know, or where does it, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and I find a lot of times like a game can be, and I'm not saying Comanauts is great and I'm not saying it's bad or whatever. I'm not saying anything about my game, but a lot of times I see games that attempt to do something. They receive, uh, they receive praise for what they attempt to do, but they don't get, sales and they don't get played and so it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with those games um it just means that they didn't get sales and they didn't get played for one reason or another and maybe it's because of the of of what we're doing with games what what we want to do as creators and what we should be doing as product makers you know what i'm saying right right like me me trying to tell a, a deep and personal story about you know, about overcoming your own emotional scars in life sounds really great, but it might not be something that somebody wants to play as a game. They might want, they might be, they might think it's cool. They might think it's interesting and it's worthwhile endeavor. But at the same time, if they want to sit down and play a game, they might be playing a game for a completely different reason. Right. They might even, you know, they might even assume that the game is going to deliver one thing and then it might not deliver that. It might deliver something else that they didn't expect or didn't want. So, what I think is so special about Plaid Hat, which has been special since the beginning, is that it seems like an environment where you as friends, as collaborators, as creative people want to make those deeply personal games that are games that you know you want to play in the hopes that you can showcase it in a way that other people might be able to relate to. And while that may be a somewhat riskier endeavor than saying what is the hot trend that we want to develop a game to for a particular market i i think that it does make games where people have much more intimate connections with and as such those are so much more powerful of experiences when it does hit when it resonates you know like i, mm -hmm. I don't think people are going to cosplay uh, as a, a even a, a scythe character, for example, you know, one of the biggest games of all time, the the emotional attachment that someone has with that is not likely going to be the same level of emotional attachment that someone has with Dead of Winter, that someone has with uh -huh. Mice and Mystics, that someone has with Comanauts. Uh -huh. And so I, I'm not saying that one way is inherently good or bad, because I, I love games for all sorts of reasons, but... I do think that that is one of the elements that makes plaid hat games so unique and so special in this industry. And anytime that I think about uh, the criticism of asthma day being this looming giant, who's just eating up these small companies that I have to remember myself is that that environment has been preserved and uh -huh. every time that I've talked with you or Isaac or Colby or, or Nikki even, unless you guys are really good at hiding uh, the, the true terror of your Orwellian 1984 existence <laughs> within this mega company, it really seems like that, that heart and soul of Plat Hat Games is still there. Yeah, I mean, all of the above. First of all, though, I want to say... Asmo Day is a great company to work for. <laughs> like this idea that Asmo Day is like this big Borg eating up all these little game companies. You know, from an outsider looking in, that might seem like what it is. But like on the inside of this game company, man, this is a great company. <laughs> it is a great company to work for. Fantastic. Um, and like when it comes to like, you know, what we do, like I am given, I'm given some freedom over choices in what I do. And so like, for instance, with Comanauts uh, and Aftermath, I pitched both these games to my leadership, my chain of command. Um, we had a meeting 
they literally looked at me and were like, well, which one do you want to do first? And I'm like, well, you know, I have this, I'm torn because I have one that is, is very, very complex and, um, and it's ambitious and it could really push my design skills to the limit. And, but it's such a, you know, it's, it's a story I'm ready to tell in coma nuts. And then I have this other thing that's so fun and interesting and, and, and right in my wheelhouse that I'm just itching and chomping at the bit to design it, you know, and that's aftermath, you know, and I think that people will love this world and they'll really identify with it, especially people who, you know, love my work and love Mice and Mystics and they'll feel really at home in this game. And I had these two things and, you know, people looked at me and they were like, I think you ought to do this one. I think you ought to do that one. Um, and I, you know, I took their advice and I went with Comanots first and Aftermath second. So, Well, Jerry, as always, it is such a pleasure talking to you. And it, as always, I'm left with about 100 questions that <laughs> I want to ask you that I'm going to have to table for next time. Is there anything else that you want to let people know about as, as they're checking out what's on the horizon in board games? I mean, we just mentioned Origins is going on right now, so the podcast will probably go up after that. Uh, you have Abomination, you have Aftermath, you have Battlelands, the Aftermath edition. Anything else you want to plug for yourself or for Plat Hat Games? Yeah, yeah, we got Quirky Circuits, which is really awesome, uh, designed by Nikki Valens, and um, we have... Um, super punch fighter out now super light little you know fun little video game uh fighter kind of uh sim and um yeah just uh come and see us at gen con because uh we're gonna be demoing a bunch of games we're gonna be demoing aftermath um we're gonna be demoing battlelands we're gonna have all of our games are gonna be there all of our stuff that we're that we got going on and um and I just and come up and say hi because I, I can't wait to show off Aftermath to everybody. I think people are just going to really, you know, attach to the game. And, um, yeah, super excited. Super exciting. All right, I Jerry. really appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, it, it is always a pleasure. You are such a real dude, and I always get something out of a conversation. Like, irrespective of what the audience is getting— this <laughs> this interview, my annual Jerry interview, this one is from me. So thank you, everyone, for listening to <laughs> the Cardboard Herald. Thank you, Jerry, for coming on to the show. Go check out all the Plaid Hat stuff on the horizon. And, you know, I'm excited for Aftermath. Thanks again, Jerry. Thanks, man. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website, CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.